الحمد لله رب العالمين نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئة أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته It was in the year 1095 when the Catholic Pope Urban II called for something that we now know as a crusade. It was a declaration, a call uh, in the land of Clement in France calling brigands and thieves and knights towards an expedition that came to be known as a crusade. The reasons why that was called uh, by Pope Urban II and then became a formal uh, papal bull, an edict, uh, calling the Christian crusade, a uh, Catholic world to fight in war against the Muslims in Jerusalem is for many reasons. One of them was that there were rumors that were coming from pilgrims, Western pilgrims going to Jerusalem uh, every year that they were mistreated by the Muslims of that great city and on the way meaning they were pillaged and their caravans were attacked and that information was going back to the Europeans and the Christians and for that reason they had an incentive they thought to recapture Jerusalem from the Muslims. Number two, there was uh, a time and this is true historically when the Fatimid Shia Khalif al-Hakim bi Amr Allah destroyed a part of the Holy Sepulchre. Remember of course that this is a, a place that the Christians believe to be the most sanctified holy place on earth. This is a place where they believe falsely and incorrectly that Jesus uh, died and was buried there before he was resurrected. We believe he was not killed nor was he crucified but it was made to appear thereof. But they, because this was attacked and it was partly destroyed, they believed that they had some kind of an incentive to go and fight and recapture Jerusalem from the Muslims. Number three, there were stereotypes about Islam. Remember of course here the, the dichotomy because in the Muslim world we had Christians living with us and they were welcomed and they were respected living as citizens of the state. And so Muslims we knew and they knew about Christianity and they knew about what they believe and this is from the Quran and from the Sunnah, we believe all of this. But the Christians had no Muslim living in their lands. So they would make up things, stereotypes, images, as if they would say things like, we worship our Prophet Muhammad They would say things like, babies are slaughtered on the, in the minbar, on the, in the pulpit, in their mosques. All these crazy, crazy beliefs they would attribute to us. Uh, and fourthly, and this is a big point here, politically, the uh, Constantine, Emperor Alexius Comnenus wrote a letter to the Catholic Pope asking for assistance because the Muslims were intruding. The Seljuk Muslims were intruding. And so he fared for his empire and he asked and appealed for assistance from the Catholic Pope to call the crusade, the, the Catholic Christians, not the Byzantines because Constantinople was under the Byzantines, Byzantines, Greek Orthodox, and there was a difference between them. And so he... Uh, he called the, the Christians for a crusade and so all these reasons put together then they believed that they had a justification, legitimate justification to go and travel to Jerusalem one year journey. Many would die along the way. More than one third of those people died along the way in the harshness of the environment, the tiredness, fatigue in the journey lack of food, lack of water, but they made that journey anyway. And so we have to appreciate to begin with that they did that for religious reasons. It was not like they went as the Byzantine hordes of yesterday. It was different. There was a religiosity in their experience. They were called Peregrini Milite Christi. They were pilgrim knights of Christ. They traveled with the pilgrim staff and the pilgrim purse. They made a vow or declaration to do that and to die for God's sake, for Jesus' sake, for God's sake. They did all of these things. They wrote in their charters the reason why they're going. And they went, you know, for religious reasons. Not all of them. Many of them, they went for land. 
They went there to settle once they've recaptured Jerusalem, to settle there at financial reasons. But most of them, I think, went there for religious reasons. And this is one of the reasons why they took the Muslim world by surprise. So when they traveled and they went, these crusaders who went as armed pilgrims, armed pilgrims, traveling to Jerusalem, they took the city of Jerusalem by surprise. The siege didn't last very long. And we bear this in mind that the Muslim world was divided, fragmented. Not only did you have the schism between the Sunni and the Shia and ongoing antagonism and conflict between them, but within the Sunni world, you had divisions between the Seljuk princes so that when Jerusalem was being besieged by the Crusaders, the two sons of the Nilam al-Mulk, the Wazir Birkiruk and Muhammad were fighting against one another when Jerusalem was being besieged. So people had no real true connection about the sanctity of the land of Jerusalem except for those living there and the religious people of that vicinity. But it was quite chaotic and very a lot of division in that time. So they recaptured Jerusalem in the year 1099. What happened then? What happened? And this is the first point I wanted to make really about this. I don't want this to be a historical lesson. I think there is, you know, very pertinent lessons that we can extrapolate from these historical anecdotes and these circumstances and these events. One of them is this. The first response we have on record in all the chronicles, the first Muslim response we have to the occupation of Jerusalem came from who? It didn't come from a scholar. His came some years later. It didn't come from the Sultan. They were quite apathetic. It didn't come from the Khalif. Very apathetic, distant, divorced from this. It came in fact from a poet. It came from a poet by the name of Abu Muzaffar al-Abi Waradi rahimahullah. He wrote a poem and that poem now is memorialized in our world until today. Where he said in his poem, وَكَيْفَ تَنَامُ الْعَيْنِ مِلْ أَجْفُونُهَا عَلَىٰ هَفَوَاتٍ أَيْكَضَتْ كُلُّ نَائِمْ وَإِخْوَانِكُمْ بِالشَّامِ يُضْحِي مَقِيلُهُمْ ظُهُورَ الْمَذَاكِ أَوْ بُطُونَ الْقَشَائِمْ وَكَادَهُنَّ مُسْتَجِنَّ بِطَيْبَةٍ يُنَادِي بِأَعْلَى الصَّوْتِ يَا أَلَى هَاشِمْ وَكَيْفَ تَنَامُ الْعَيْنِ He says, how could the eyes sleep between the lids at a time of disaster like this that would awaken any sleeper whilst your brothers in Sham are sleeping in the bellies of vultures? That's self-projection. You know, we have self, other constructs, that's self. In, this is an ummah. They, they saw this is an ummah. You have responsibilities towards yourself, protection of yourself. Pain of others is pain in you. This is how they saw it. How could the eye sleep at a time like this that would awaken any sleeper whilst your brothers in Sham are sleeping in the bellies of vultures? And this is war and it's like the one who is lying in his tomb in Medina وسلم, raises his voice and says, O sons of Hashem. This was an appeal to the Abbasid Khilafah. Help, assistance, money, something of assistance. But there was no response. There was no response. No money came, no financial assistance, no large armies of the Khalif in Baghdad came along, nothing. And so it was in the year 1105 that a Muslim contingent on two occasions traveled from Damascus to Baghdad. One of them was led by the chief Qadi of Damascus called Abu Sa'id al-Harawi. Abu Sa'id al-Harawi was Shafi Faqih, the chief Qadi of Damascus traveled with a group of people Amongst them Abu, uh, Abu Muzaffar al-Abi Waradi rahimullah, and others and they traveled from Damascus to Baghdad to petition the Khalif for help. They arrived on the day of Juma on Friday and they went in. In one of the reports they entered the masjid, they broke the minbar. They broke the minbar as to just demonstrate their outrage. This is a, a big thing that's happening in Sham while these people are just getting on with life business as usual business as usual now not only was there no you know he recited the poem this poem i just read and it's longer than that he recited the whole poem not only was there no real you know 
feeling and people were not that moved. But the key thing that happened is that the people were threatened with punishment for arriving and disrupting the scene. Because, and this is a key point about buffer, about buffers. Historically, we'll look at a few of them, but this is the first one I want to mention. How we see, how the world sees political buffers. Because as they arrived there, not only was it no help for them, the Khalif threatened to punish them. Why? Because it coincided with the arrival of the Khalif's second wife from Isfahan. It coincided with the arrival of the Khalif's second wife from Isfahan on the same day. So you can see then the contrast here between the merriment and the joy and the occasion of celebration and these people coming with that bad news. That's a political buffer. And there's been many like that in human history. We remember if our, we have a good historical framing of things in 1966 when the, uh, there was an uprising in Indonesia. Mark Kurt has written an article about this, very good, you should read it, called The, the Million Dead in Indonesia. One million people were killed in Indonesia when this power struggle between Sukarta and Suharto came. And Suharto was not compliant with the IMF regulations. And so there was a coup that was instigated by Britain to have him deposed of and somebody else comes in place who was compliant with the IMF regulations. In any case, the Indonesians, they rose up and they revolted, but it was crushed. One million people were killed in that uprising in 1966. One of the reasons, one of the reasons there was no immediate response from uh, Britain who instigated the whole thing and the British people was because it coincided with the fact that Britain won, England won the Football World Cup in 1966. And so the focus then was on achievement and celebration rather than it being on something that was negative. 1968, two years after that you had the, the event in Vietnam in the My Lai Massacre. Anybody who knows a bit about the My Lai Massacre, a good book to read called Four Hours in My Lai, about what the Americans did in this poor village of peasants, farmers, peasants, people just doing, minding their own business. And the Americans came and they shot everyone to death, killed everybody and stuffed them in trenches. They killed babies, babies, everything, everything that moved, wildlife, they killed everything. In Mi Lai, 1968. Now by the time that information came back into America and it was beginning, it was a bit of a delay in it, but by the time it was 1969, what happened? America lands on the moon. Now because America lands on the moon, all the focus now is on the celebration and the moment of, of a big merriment and congratulations for that. Nobody wants to know in fact about uh, what happened in Milai. And this is how we are distracted as people. Stefan Assel just died last year. What did he write in his very seminal work, Time for Outrage? He wrote in that that was one of the key inspirations behind the Occupy Wall Street movement in America, that small pamphlet of a book. He wrote that book at the age of 93, Jewish, as a Jewish individual. He survived Auschwitz, survived the Holocaust, and then lived in uh, French resistance movements in his entire life. And he wrote that book at the age of 93 as a testament for you know, people after him. Uh, this is his last words he wanted to write before he died, and he died last year. But what did he write in his book? He has outrage over many things, outrage over global poverty. His penultimate chapter is outrage over Palestine, Jewish individual. He says, the greatest indignation I have in the world today is for what's happening to the Palestinians. But that's not the point right here. The point is about the buffer. Because in his last sentence, what does he say? He says that we call for a mass public uprising against the means of mass communication that offer nothing but mass consumption as a prospect for our youth. General amnesia in the outrageous competition of all against all. That's our disease of consumerism, of our fixation fascination with things, stuff, 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 things. We have no time to worry about global poverty or about the plight and the predicament of people outside of us because we're so entranced with the world within us, right now around us. And that's above us. So you have many of these and so there was no response they were threatened with punishment because it coincided with the arrival of the second, of the Khalif's second wife from Isfahan. Then you had in 1105 a response from a, a, a faqih, 
Ali ibn Tahir al-Sulami rahimahullah wrote a book called Kitab al-Jihad, the book of jihad. And in that book, he outlined the strategy of the crusaders. He said, these are not people only in tent or with Jerusalem. No, Sicily, Spain, Jerusalem, they're looking for conquest. They're going to conquer much more than Jerusalem after Jerusalem. And it's true because they captured en route to Jerusalem the coastal cities. Sidon, Acre, Tyre were all taken by the Crusaders. And so he was trying to warn the Muslims, this is what's happening. He also appealed to the Khalif, do your responsibility as a vice regent of Allah on earth. Appeal to the Muslim masses to unify and not divide. And it was really a, a big, you know, a very, very important text that he wrote in that year. But you see what happens, my dear brothers and sisters in Islam, there was no response. No response, no political response. Again, still they're just fighting, the Seljuk Sultans are fighting against, except in small cases, there were some attempts, but they were quashed early. Crusaders were strong now, they had recaptured Jerusalem, it was in their hands, it was called the Latin Kingdom of Jerusalem. The Latin Kingdom of Jerusalem, it was in their hands now. And the Muslims are, what are you supposed to do now, if the Khalif is not going to send his huge armies of the Muslims? And so a decade goes past, two decades go past, three decades go past. The most important moment for the Muslim Ummah at that time came in the year 1144. In the year 1144, the Sultan, the Zengid Sultan, you had these familial dynasties of the Zengids and the Ayyubids. And he was the head of the Zengid household, the Zengid family. He recaptured the state of Edessa. And that was a crusader state, but by recapturing it for the first time, it showed the Muslims, no, these are a people who bleed like you bleed. They have loss like you have loss. They have victory like you have victory. There is no real need to fear them so much. And the, the fact that the Muslims recaptured, there was four crusader states, and that was one of them. Jerusalem was another of them, and that was one of them. And so to recapture one of them at least, it gave the Muslims some incentive that maybe this could lead to greater prospects for the Muslim Ummah. But Zengi, he wasn't to live much longer after that. In 1146, he was killed, assassinated by one of his own people. But it was his son. It was his son, Nuruddin. His son, Nuruddin Zengi, rahimullah, was an amazing person. They would say, Ibn al-Athir rahimahullah said, وَقَدْ طَالَعْتُ سِيرَ الْمُلُوكَ الْمُتَّقَدِّمِينَ وَلَمْ أَرَى بَعْدَ خُلَفَ الرَّاشِدِينَ أَفْضَلْ مِنْ نُورَ الدِّينَ He says, I have read all the stories of the kings of the past. All their stories, all their accounts, biographies. And he says, I have never seen a story of a man more worthy after the Khulafa al-Rashidin than Nur al-Din Zengi rahimahullah. How much then is it, is it important for us to teach our children about Nur al-Din Zengi? How much should they know about someone as instrumental as Nur al-Din Zengi? If his contemporaries are saying that after reading all of the stories of the kings of the past, after the Khulafa al-Rashidin, we found no one who was greater than Nur al-Din Zengi rahimahullah. A man who realized that our war against the Crusaders is not only a physical one, that's temporal. That's just temporal. It's not only a physical one, it has to be also be a spiritual one. That we're in desperate need of the help from Allah, assistance from Allah. We need Allah's assistance. And so he realized it must be two. They would say about him, Dhul jihadain min aduwin wa nafs, fahuwa tul al hayati fi hayjai. They said that he combined two struggles within himself one against the enemy physically, and one against himself. One against the nafs, one fighting the lower self to achieve that taqwa, the piety with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that Allah listens to your supplications. So Allah is with you then. That's how he was, a man of principle, a man of honor. A man who would pray qiyamul layl and command others to pray qiyamul layl. A man who would fast often. That's how he was described as someone who would fight in the day and he would fast in the, in the day and he would pray in the night. That's how he was described. There was, a, a, there was a time, in fact, subhanAllah, where early on in his reign, he used to charge people high taxes to make, to make payments for stipends and he would charge high taxes. One of his, Ibn al-Athir relates this and he says one of 
the, the people come along, the poets come along and they say, Ya Nur al-Din, ماذا تقول إذا وقفت بموقف فرد ذليل والحساب عسير وتعلقت فيما الخصوم وأنت في يوم الحساب مسلسل مجرور وتفرقت عنك الجنود وأنت في ضيق القبور موسد مقبور يا نور الدين أو نور الدين ماذا تقول what you gonna say what you gonna say when you stand alone before Allah and your accountability on that day will be hard what you gonna do what you gonna say Nur al-Din if you're lying in your grave and your armies will desert you they said, Nur al-Din, prepare an excuse before yourself. Have something great that you've done in your life that you could say to Allah, I did this for you, O oh Allah. And what he's trying to say to him, lower your taxes. Lower your taxes. Irham, mercy, have some mercy on the people, lower your taxes. And on account of that poem, he reduced his taxes. Allah Akbar. People they will say to him, you know, he used to give stipends to like uh, the shiyukh, the elderly, the elderly people praying in the masjid who could not fight and he would give money to the, the fighters also. But people would say to him, why are you giving money to those who are praying in the masjid? Why are you giving money to people who are not fighting? They're just busying themselves with reciting Quran or in the masjid. They're old, old people. Why would you give money to them? He said to them, Inni la, la ara. I do not see victory illa biha ula, except with those people. I don't see victory except with those people. He said, Why would I transfer money from a people anni, who fight on my behalf for me when they don't see me? When they don't see me and transfer that money to another people who only fight for me when they see me with arrows that sometimes hit and sometimes miss whereas the arrows of the others never miss their targets meaning their prayers to Allah their supplication to Allah never misses their target Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and so he really embodied the spirit of Islam of honesty and decency and, and good living frugality, frugality over greed if we learn, if we learn this in our deen, the importance of frugality over greed, you would see how it would transform us as a people. Not gluttony, but frugality over greed. This is what he showed and how he taught the people and how he showed the people. So, Nur al-Din, there are two important dates I want you to remember. One is 1131 and the other is 1137. Now I know we're going back slightly because we've already mentioned the capture of Adas 1144. But this is to do now with Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi rahimahullah. We cannot speak about Salah al-Din without first saying something about Nur al-Din. You cannot speak about Salah al-Din without understanding the, the context in which he was living. So we can't jump, simply jump straight into his life without first speaking about these points to begin with. In 1131, Zengi the ruler of Mosul used to make these incursions into Baghdad. You know, power, family, dynasty, expanse, expanse. This is like, you know, for your doing it in the name of your family. But what happened is in 1131, he gets to Baghdad, but he was defeated. When he's now going back out of uh, Baghdad, he needs a place to stay. The father of Salah al-Din, Najmuddin Ayyub, was the like Wazir of Tikrit in Baghdad in the name of the Khalif for the armies of Khalif he was protecting Tikrit but when Zengi yeah, the father of Nur al-Din uh, comes down from uh, sorry the, yeah, the father of Nur al-Din comes down from a defeat he ends up in Tikrit and he asks for help he petitions Najm al-Din Ayyub who he doesn't even know but he maybe thought maybe out of just like, you know, good, good uh, favor or good kind of, uh, you know, human conduct, he might just give me some kind of uh, an escape route. What Najm din Ayyub does is he keeps him in Tikrit for 15 days. 15 days until people, they think we don't know where he's gone until then he sends him out, go back to Mosul where you came from and don't make trouble again. 
That's a favor. This is the father of Salahuddin, Najmuddin Ayyub, the father of Salahuddin, does a favor to the father of Nuruddin, Zengi. In 1137, it reverses. Reverses now. Because what happens is that the brother of Najmuddin Ayyub, the father of Salahuddin, his brother Shirku, killed a Christian scribe. Killed a Christian scribe in Tikrit. And so the Khalif expels both of them. Get out for what you did. These were people they had rights, Allahu Akbar, from the hadith of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Whoever harms a dhimmi, he harms me. And that Christian scribe was a citizen of the state with rights and protection. And he was killed off for what? Nothing. And so both were expelled. But now, Zengi, who's back in Mosul, doesn't forget the favor. And this is 1137. On the night that they're leaving, Tikrit Salahuddin al Ayyubi is born. On the night they were leaving, Tikrit Salahuddin was born. And they go straight to Mosul where uh, Zengi is, repaying the favor. Repaying the favor. So in his early years, Salahuddin, in his early years and his adolescence, he's brought up and raised by the other household, the opposing household, the household of the Zengids. It was uh, Zengi who was raising him up and then when he's killed, as, as we just mentioned before, Nuruddin rahimullah, was mentoring Salahuddin, was teaching him chivalry, teaching him ethics, teaching him principles of war, teaching him and the entourage, scholarly entourage around Nuruddin is now around Salahuddin. The reciters of Quran, Hadith, learning, Deen, Salah Deen is benefiting from this company. But Nur al-Deen is not going to live forever. And nobody lives forever. One of the, the things that Nur al-Deen did before he died in 1174 is he sent Shirku, the uncle, and Salah Deen to Egypt. Nur al-Deen, he had a, a plan of action. It was in three parts. Number one, to unify Sham. Sham was divided, Syria between Aleppo and Damascus. And they realized there's no way you could defeat the Crusaders with a divided Syria. Because the Crusaders would come and just pick it off, pick it off. You gotta unify yourself, come together, and then we have a force. We have strength against the Crusaders. Number two was defeat of the Fatimid Shia in Egypt because they would all, they would oftentimes ally themselves with the Crusaders against the Muslims. And number three, the reconquest of Jerusalem. Now I'll tell you something amazing that he did. And this is Wallahi instrumental for all of us. This is Nur al-Din. You see, in, Dama in Syria you had these internal states, Baalbek, Hama, Homs, and Damascus. Baalbek, Hama, Homs, and, and Damascus. And in these states, from the days of Nizam al-Mulk, Nizam al-Mulk was the wazir of the, of the Seljuk Sultan, died just before the Crusaders arrived. Now you know about Nizam, Nizamiya, because the madrasas today are named after him. The Nizamiya madrasas in India, in Pakistan, are named after him, and also in the Arab world, named after him, Nizam al-Mulk. Now what happens is that in these internal states of Hama, Homs, and Damascus, and Baalbek, you had madrasas. You know what Nuruddin does? He does this. And this had really, really a pivotal effect in the uh, prospects for the jihad in that time. What he does is that he ensures that in these centers of learning, these schools of learning, the people are learning Fadail, Fadail al Quds, Fadail al Sham, Fadail Dimashq. They're learning about the virtues of Jerusalem and the virtues of Sham, the virtues of Damascus. Because it's an obvious point, but look at how he enacted it. Why on earth, why, he, they believed, why would people travel all the way to Jerusalem and fight and defend a city, maybe die in that city, settle in that city, if they don't know about the importance of that city? They don't know why Sham essentially is important. And so they began a process, some were written before, the Crusaders even arrived, like Al-Raba'i, Al-Wasati, these were early books on Fadail al-Quds. 
And some were written in the 1150s by as samaani and others, Fadail al-Sham, Fadail al-Quds, about the virtues of Jerusalem. Hadith. Ala wa inna al-Iman idha waqa'at al-fitan bisham. Indeed, the Prophet of Allah said, indeed, that when the fitan strikes, Iman, Iman, faith, faith, Iman is in Sham. Ya Tuba li Sham, Ya Tuba li Sham, Ya Tuba li Sham, O oh, glad tidings for Sham, O oh, glad tidings for Sham, O oh, glad tidings for Sham, wa bima dhalik ya Rasulullah. And what is that for you, Rasulullah? Tilka malaikatullah, basiqu ajni hatta ala Sham, those are the angels of Allah that wrap their wings around Sham. Hadith. لا تزال الطائفة من أمتي منصورين لا يضرهم من خذلهم حتى تقوم الساد will always remain a party from my ummah manifest upon the truth victorious until the end of time in one narration that you will find in these books of Fadail where are they Ya Rasulullah in and around Damascus one narration in and around Quds one narration in Sham and so the focus therefore was in that part of the world and these hadith were used to stimulate the people, the yearning for Jerusalem. And we know what Allah says in the Quran, أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم سبحان الذي أسرى بعبده ليلا من المسجد الحرام إلى المسجد الأقصى الذي باركنا حوله لنوريه من آياتنا Glory be to Allah, him who took his servant by night from the sacred precinct of Mecca to the sacred precinct of Aqsa by night and showed him our, whose precincts we have blessed to show him some of our signs. And so then they were familiarizing themselves with these hadith. They used the madrasa to teach people what was relevant in the contemporary setting. It wasn't all, you know, the, the basic Islamic education. It had a contemporary relevance for today. What, what is the Muslim world experiencing today? How much do we need to learn? about suffering, about conflict, about genocide, about ethics, about justice, about values, so that our generation is not one that is apathetic, like those first people in 1099 who just didn't know what to do, couldn't care that much. But no, there were a people who knew how to respond in ways that were appropriate, in ways that were appropriate. Salah Hadin then, you know, lives in this situation with these great people, Nur Din then dies in 1174. Salah Hadin was in Egypt, defeats the Crusaders in Egypt, defeats the Fatimid, the last Fatimid Khalif died, and now Salah Hadin is left with this measurable task of keeping up the unification of the Muslim world, but more than that, what about the people of Yemen? What about the people of Hijaz? What about the whole of Iraq? where the Khalif is based, those early apathetic people who couldn't care that much, what about all those people? What about the Khalif himself? What about the army and the soldiers and the Muslims? What are you going to do with this? And so he began this process of working to bring in the Muslim soldiers. But it was not in his name. And this is something that you'll read again and again. And again. He's again saying, this is not in my name, not for me, not in my name. It's in the name of the Khalif. This is to embolden and strengthen the Khilafah, not in the name of Salah Hadin or the Ayyubid dynasty for the Khilafah. One of the things you know you will see in Salah Hadin is just like Nur al-Din, the one who mentored him, showed him, he also led by example. They described him, he was someone who loved the Sama al Hadith, the hearing of Hadith, and he would command his kids whenever Hadith were narrated to sit and to listen to the hearing of hadith. You had sama'at. Sama'at were public listenings of kutub al-hadith or books of fadail or hadith. And people would gather in like orchards or in masajid or in homes and they would listen to hadith. They would just listen to hadith for the barakah, for the blessing of the listening of the hadith. He was described as someone who was raqiq al-qalb, sari al-dama in the sama' al-hadith. He had a soft heart and he would cry often when hadith were narrated. That most of the times when he was free doing nothing, he would sit with his family. He would sit with his family and he would play with his kids and sit with his family and his kids 
Our deen, my dear brothers, is a deen of moderation, is a deen of balance. We take the beautiful hadith of Hamzal al-Tamimi radiallahu anhu when he goes, you know, and he spends time with Nabi Sallallahu and, and his iman was so high and he says the Prophet told us about heaven and hell and it's as if we were in heaven and hell. And then he comes out and his iman plummets slowly like it does for all of us. And so he leaves and then he says, فَضَحِكْتُ وَلَعِبْتُ I laughed and I played with my family and my kids and so my iman was a fact of what is happening here. Half an hour ago, we're with the Prophet of Allah, our iman is so high, and now half an hour later, our iman is slim going down because we're just mucking around with our families and our kids. He gets out of his home, he goes and finds Abu Bakr radiallahu and he says, Ya Abu Bakr, what is this? He says, don't worry, it's happening, it happens to all of us. He wasn't happy, he goes and finds the Prophet of Allah and he says, Ya Rasulullah, what is this has happened? He says, Ya Hanzala, لو كنتم كما تكون عندي لَصَافَحَتْكُمُ الْمَلَائِكَ عَلَى فُرُشِكُمْ أَوْ عَلَى طُرُقِكُمْ He says, Alhamdulillah, if you are with me in that same state, always, if you're always in that same state that you are with me of Iman, even the angels will come and give you salamu alaykum when you're, when you're in your beds or you're in the streets. He says, no, يَا حَمْضُلَهَا سَعَةٌ وَسَعَةٌ He says, يَا حَمْضُلَهَا سَعَةٌ وَسَعَةٌ he says, Alhamdulillah, an hour for this and an hour for that. An hour for this and an hour for that. Balance. Right? Kids have needs. Didn't the Prophet of Allah, when he's going to the house of Sahabi, and he says to my younger brother, he says, Ya Aba Umair, ma fa'alan nuhair. Ya Aba Umair, ma fa'alan nuhair. Aba Umair, what's up? What's up with your sparrow? The small boy would play with a sparrow. But you see the wisdom. Nabi Sallallahu never made him feel excluded, he was inclusive. You're also involved as part of our ummah construct. You have a need right now, you're small, your biggest thing in your life is to play with the sparrow. I will also show you the importance of the sparrow by asking you, where is your sparrow, what is up with your sparrow? Not that the Prophet of Allah is that interested in a sparrow, but just to show the boy that there is inclusion. You're also welcome and part of us. Beautiful wisdom. And so Salah Hadeen is exemplifying this, that he has his time for his kids and he has his time for the work of the Ummah, the work of unification, repelling the Crusaders. He was known as someone, he was, you know, he fed the Crusaders, William of Tyre, one of the, 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 the most important chronicler of the Crusaders, Christian chronicler, William of Tyre, he said, any ascendancy, in the power of Salah Hadin was a cause of suspicion in our eyes, for he was a man who was valiant in war, brave, wise in counsel, and generous beyond measure. <laughs> and generous beyond measure. And this is a crusader saying that about him. He's on the other side of the fence, fighting against him, writing down what they're seeing. Wise in counsel, generous beyond measure and valiant in war, courage, shuja'a. Shiddatul qalb fil ba's, that's our definition of courage. Shiddatul qalb fil ba's, having the strength of a, heart, of a heart, the strength of your heart in a moment of difficulty and despair, despondency, hardship. We have, this is not new, this is Quranic. Models of bravery and courage. From the Quran, we go back, look at Musa alayhi salam, and Fir'aun, Fir'aun is taunting, mocking Musa. Ya Musa inni la aghunnuka ya Musa mishura. I see you Musa, you're just possessed. You're a man affected by magic. What does he say in response to him? Musa alayhi salam, what does he say? Wa inni la aghunnuka ya Fir'aun mithbura. And I see you Fir'aun as someone who is destroyed already. And look at just the, the, the simple dialogue between the tyrant and the prophet, the tyrant and the messenger. But you can see the courage and the bravery in the discourse between the prophet and the tyrant. The magicians of Fir'aun. The magicians of Fir'aun who, you know, when they saw what happened with the the stick of Musa alayhi salam wa ma tilka bi yaminika ya Musa qala hiya asai it's a stick Allah teaches us tawheed oneness of Allah inna Allah ala kulli shayin qadir through a stick Allah has power over all things through a stick a stick if we didn't know what that stick could do in the beginning what is Allah asks what is in your hand of Musa he says it's a stick but then he speaks 
and I bring down the branches with a stick and I lean on the stick and I have other uses for the stick but Allah never asked him what is he doing with the stick Allah does not ask him what are you doing with the stick Allah just asks you what do you have in your right hand but look at the wisdom here not only for Musa that he's able to now speak with Allah but if we didn't know what that stick was before we wouldn't know what that stick was later on and that's the whole point so they bow down into Allah and sujood to Allah and they say we believe in the Lord of Harun and Musa you believe in him before I've given you permission to believe in him I will cut off your hands and your feet from opposite end you know wallahi the Quran teaches us the psychology of all people all people Imam Ahmad was used to say that if you want to know about yourself, read Qur'an because you will find yourself in the Qur'an. You will find yourself in the book of Allah. Allah has described you perfectly. Allah has described the dhalim, the insane, the psychopath. Fir'aun was a psychopath. Psychopathology in our world, in the, in the words of Robert Ward, and there's others of course, but what they say at least is that the psychopath is the one that has no human empathy, and he has a callous disregard for the rights of others. So in the frame of these two then, at least we would say, well, Pharaoh, he had no human empathy. And he had a callous disregard for the rights of Bani Israel, for others. Psychopath. You will know now which one of us two is more, is more severe and more lasting in punishment. The Mufassirin, they say either he's saying him and Musa or him and Allah. Either he's saying him and Musa السلام, or him and Allah. Which one of us is most severe? They only understand the power of violence, only the power of brutality, only the language of brutality. That's all they understand. It's never about goodness, ethics, virtues, values, justice, peace. No. The more you can kill sadistically, then the higher you are because people will respect you because of that. Sadistic people would respect you because of that. But not decent, fair-minded people. No. But they say, you know, Just do whatever you decree. Decree whatever you want. We will, you know, we will not, we will not prefer you, although the clear proofs come to us. Decree whatever you wish to decree because you're only decreeing the life of this world. It's an exemplary model of courage, of bravery. And so the Muslims, they were looking back at these models. Fir'aun, Musa alayhi salam, from the Salaf. Look at Sa'id ibn Jubayr rahmatullah alayhi with Hajjaj ibn Yusuf al thaqafi Look at the narrative, the discourse, the dialogues. In the correspondences between Qadi al-Fadil, who was the scribe, who was the administrator for Salah al-Din, writing letters, some of which were sent to the Crusaders, Look at the, the dialogue, the response, Salah Adin, later on to Richard the First, King Richard, what is Al Qudsu Lana Kemahua Lakum, Balhua Adamu Indana Mimahua Indakum. He says, Quds, Jerusalem is for us like it is for you, but it's more important for us than it is for you. The dialogue, Said ibn Jubair says to Hajjaj ibn Yusuf when he cornered him about to execute him, what does he say? He asked him, uh, Ma ismuk, what is your name? What does Sa'id ibn Jubair say? Rahimullah. Sa'id ibn Jubair. Sa'id, the one of felicity and happiness. Jubair, the one that mends and fixes. Hajjaj says, No, Anta Shaqi ibn Qusair. You are wretched and the one that breaks. He says, Ummi kanat a'lam bi ismi mink. Thank you very much. My mother knew my name better than you do. Thank you very much. You know, just think about the wisdom behind the discourse. Does he even have to say that? But no, he's establishing his ground, keeping his ground, showing courage and bravery. He says, Shaqiyat Ummuk, your mother was wretched and so you are also wretched. He said, Al Ghayb Ya'lamu Ghayrak. The one who knows the unseen, the one who is Shaqi and Sa'id in the Quran, Allah knows who is wretched and who is felicitous. Allah knows someone other than you, Allah knows that. So Hajjaj is infuriated, just, he says to him, choose how you want to be killed today. He says, Ikhtar anta ya Hajjaj, you choose today. Why? You choose because you will not kill me today, except Allah will kill you the same way in the next life. Allah will kill you 
the same way in the next life. So you choose today how you want to kill me. He's just vexed, infuriated, just kill him off. He recites Quran, Allah Akbar, Quran, Rabi al Mu'min. The Quran is a spring of the believer. Spring of the believer. Inni wajjahtu wajhiya lilladhi fatra samawati wal ard. Hanifa, wa ma ana min al mushrikeen. I turn my face towards Allah. Allah, the originator of the heavens and the earth, in his oneness, I am not one of the mushrikeen. He turns towards Qibla and he recites this. Hajjaj says, turn his face away from Qibla and then kill him. Quran, the spring of the believer, what does he recite? فَأَيْنَمَا تُوَلُّوا فَثَمَّ وَجْهُ اللَّهِ So wherever you turn, well then there is a face of Allah. Uh, Hajjaj is really infuriated now. He says, throw him on the floor and kill him. Push him down and then just cut him off. What does he recite, my dear brothers? Quran is a spring of the believer. Minha khalaqnakum wa fiha nu'idukum wa minha nukhrijukum taratan ukhra. Allah, Allah. Allah, Allah. Minha khalaqnakum. It's from the earth you were created. And it's to the earth you will go back a second time. You will return to the earth. And it's from the earth you will come out a second time. Hajjaj had nothing to say. Sa'id ibn Jubair met his end that day, but he had nothing, as, uh, nothing to say. Ibn Abi Dhe'ib rahmatullah alayhi was in the mosque of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa When the Khalif al-Mahdi used to come in, everybody had to rise, rise up, stand up. He didn't used to get up. And so the Khalif is walking past and he sees him. Limadha lam taqum, why don't you get up? What does he say? Aradtu an aqum. I wanted to get up. I wanted to get up. Honestly, I did. But then I remember the words of Allah in the Quran, يَوْمَ يَقُومُ النَّاسِ لِرَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ On that day, people will stand up for the Lord of the world. He said, I saved my standing up for that day. Thank you very much. Allah, Allah. <laughs> Imam Tawus, rahmatullah alayhi, was in the haram. In the haram. And Hajjaj ibn Yusuf al thaqafi is there. There is an old man. Old man, Shaykh al Kabir is making tawaf. Old man. And he says, and uh, Hajjaj says to the old man, Min Ain and where are you from? He says, Me, I'm in Ahli Yemen. I'm from the people of Yemen. He says, Ah, how did I leave my brother, my brother, Akhi? How did I leave him with you? His brother Muhammad was the governor of Yemen. He said, How did I leave my brother with you? He says to him, Man Akhuk, who's your brother? He says, You don't know, I am Hajjaj, my brother is Muhammad. He says, Ah, Taraktahu Saminan Batinan. You left him as a very fat man for us. An overeater, a very fat man for us. Hajjaj becomes angry. He says, you do not know. He says, I, I wasn't asking about his health. I'm asking about his ruling. He says, ah, taraktahu ghashuman ghaluman. You left him as a tyrant for us. He becomes angry. He says, you do not know I am Hajjaj and he's my brother Muhammad. Look at what he says. Atawunnu. You think your brother is given more honor, izzah, knowing that you're his brother more than I am given honor with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You think your brother has more honor knowing that you're his brother more than I have honor with Allah. This is really how they were in that time. And so the purpose was to exemplify this model of courage and bravery and Salah Hadeen, he sought to do that. And people, even the non-Muslims, William of Tyre, respected him for doing that. Focus, focus. Just like Nur al-Din had a focus, three-point plan, Jerusalem, unification, and defeat of the Fatimids. Salah Hadeen had the same. They would say about him that he was, he would say things like, وَكَيْفَ يَطِيبُ لِي الْفَرَحْ وَالطَّعَامِ وَلَذَّةُ الْمَنَامِ وَبَيْتُ الْمَقْدِسِ بِعِدِ الصَّلِبِيِّينَ وَكَيْفَ يَطِيبُ لِي الْفَرَحْ وَالطَّعَامِ How can this enjoyment and good food make me happy and pleased when Jerusalem is in the hands of the Crusaders? Purpose, focus, effort. How could it please me to live like this when Jerusalem is in the hands of the Crusaders. They would say about him 
Bahauddin ibn Shaddad says about him, Rahimullah, wa kana indahu min al quds amrun azim, la tahmilu illa al jibal. They said that when it came to Jerusalem, it was a, a very big issue for him. Something that not even the mountains could carry. It was a tremendous, exact undertaking that he put upon himself. The recovery and the recapture of Jerusalem. They said about him, that he was like a mother bereaved of her child. And he would take his horse and go place to place and say, you know, why Islam, why Islam? Oh, calling upon the Muslim Ummah, they are our obligations for Islam. He was also a person of mercy, mercy and justice. And this is something that even the Crusaders recognized in him. Mercy and justice. Let us take one anecdote here. There was an occasion. Jazakumullah khairan. Thank you so much. There was an occasion. Uh, there was a woman, a woman, a Crusader. Well, she wasn't a crusader, she was a Frank. So she was a settler woman, Frankish woman. Not all were crusaders, because crusaders were those who came to fight, and Franks were just those who settled after decades and decades, new generations of people. She was a Frankish settler. And she was in her tent, and she had a baby. And so what one of the Muslims did is that he went inside that tent and he stole her baby, took her baby. So, She's obviously like uh, any mother would be, so bereaved, full of anguish. She's out of her tent and she's screaming, wailing, wailing for her child. That somebody had taken the child to sell the child on the black market. The news reaches Salah ad -Din. This is what's happened to this Frankish woman. In Ibn Shaddad's report, فَرَقَّ لَهَا رِقَّةً شَدِيدًا he had so much uh, sympathy, pity, sympathy and pity for that woman because her child was taken. And so what he does is he takes money from his pocket and he pays it to his you know, people around him and says, go and find out what's happened to that child, that baby. And when they go, they find that baby is about to be sold in the market. They take that money that Salah Adin gave them and they give it to that uh, to bring back the child back. But Ibn Shaddad, this is a, the key point here. Ibn Shaddad says that I saw Salah Adin and that woman standing together and they're both crying. And they're both weeping. They're both crying. Both the woman and Salah Adin are both crying over what's happened to that woman. We are not beasts, my dear brothers. We are not beasts. We are not beasts. We're not cruel beasts. Allah made us an ummah of rahmah, of peace, of mercy. Not only Allah is Rahman Rahim, our beloved Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, illa rahmatil alameen. We do not send you, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, except as a mercy for the whole of mankind, for all people. So he, he says that I saw, you know, both were weeping in that situation. The maintenance of justice was paramount in the Muslim world, in the empire. And in what Salah Adin was doing, he only learned from those who came before him, in particular Nur al Din, about maintaining justice. Ya ayyuhalladheena aminu kunu qawamina lillah shuhada bil qistah wala yajrimannakum shana'an qawmin ala alla ta'dilu i'diluhu wa aqrabu li taqwa This here is the impediment of hate. This is the impediment of hate. 
You have another one in the impediment of love. Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu kunu qawwamina bil qisti shuhada'a lillah wa law ala anfusikum aw li walidayni wal aqrabin. This is the impediment of love. You could love somebody something so much it could swerve you from justice because you're not going to say the right thing at the right time with regards to the right person. But also hate. You could hate somebody something so much it could make you swerve from justice. Allah is saying in the imperative dilu be just and that is closer to piety. So where we don't, he didn't like the fact that they were there on Muslim land. But that was something that was done and he saw it upon himself to rectify the wrong. So when people go back to Western Europe, they can say, we saw, we saw some good, learn something good from the Muslims about maintenance of justice and so on and so forth. It was now in the 1180s, 1180. 586, there was a truce between Salah Hadin and a man called Raymond of Tripoli, who was one of the head of the Crusaders. But that truce was running out. Salah Hadin, just before that, he had two catastrophic moments in his life. One was an illness. He had two major illnesses in his life, and both were life threatening. And this an illness, they thought he was going to die. Everybody was worried that Salah Hadin was going to die because he had this major illness, but he recovered from it. But then, just as he recovered, his wife, Ismat Adin, dies. She dies. And they kept that information from Salah Adin because they knew that if he knew that information, he, would, he might just lose all hope, resolve, and say, you know what, pack your bags. Anything could happen. And so they kept that information from him, at least for the time being. The truce between Raymond of Tripoli and Salah Adin was coming to an end. Salah Adin. He had good reason, good reason not to renew the truce or for a few reasons. There was a man called Reynold de Chatillon. Reynold de Chatillon was the prince of Karak. He was someone who the Muslims imprisoned because he was a, a fitna maker. A man who was just making fitna, was do, doing crazy things, crazy things, pillaging and plundering and, and they imprisoned him. But then he was released. And when he was released, what did he do? There was a, a link between Karak. What he did is he, he plundered a caravan en route. And he took the possessions and he harmed the men and he stole the money. And this was a violation of the truth. A violation of the truth. Now we must be fair to say that the crusaders in Jerusalem did not like Reynold de Chatillon. They didn't even agree with what he did. But, to be, but the, the fact was that he was one of their own. He was still a crusader and they were all crusaders. And so then they needed to cover him up. But Salah Din then, because of what he did, he had good reason not to renew the truce. Number two, his armies were so large and speaking all different languages, Arabic, Kurdish, Turkish, all different languages from all parts of the Muslim world. Badruddin Dildrim. Qaymuz and Najmi, Fakhruddin and Zafarani, these three uh, you know, generals of his army in three different distinct places in Balad al Sham that he could call at any moment. And he called all of them Badruddin Dildrim, Qaymuz and Najmi, Fakhruddin and Zafarani. And the idea let's set out for Tiberias. Now, this was very, very clever on behalf of Salah ad Din. Because Raymond of Tripoli, his wife was in Tiberias. And so when he said, let's set out for Tiberias, they, Raymond thought he's going to go and attack his wife. But no, it was bait. Let's just go there and we'll bring the crusaders all there. And we're in a much stronger position. We have much bigger army, stronger army. We're fit, we're healthy. And if they were to come to Tiberias, they would have to travel from very far. And it's very hot, and they'll get very thirsty, and they'll die on the way. If they don't die on the way, they get very too, too tired to fight. So what happens is that they all head for Tiberias, even though Raymond was advising the king of Jerusalem, Gide, you sing on that this is a bait. They didn't believe him. They all went to Tiberias. Now it's very hot, very hot. One of the first things Salah Hadin does is he ignites uh, fire scrubs fire scrubs because he knew that the westerly wind would blow in the direction of the crusaders 
And so all around, fire scrubs. And the wind, the smoke, the ashes is blowing in the direction of the crusaders. Not only are they so fatigued and so tired and so thirsty, but now they're kind of uh, in this conundrum situation because the, the fire scrubs. Uh, Salah Hadin, his army was very strong. What ensued then was a battle in the year 1187 called the Battle of Hattin. This battle, the Battle of Hattin, Ibn al-Athir says after the, the great early battles in Islam, there was no battle that was greater for the Muslims than this battle. This was a decisive battle between the Crusaders and the Muslims. This was a time where the Crusaders had a relic called the True Cross. The True Cross. Early, early on in the first crusade, there was also a second crusade by the way, they, they believed they'd found, based upon a dream someone had, uh, a, a, a fragment of, they believed falsely, the cross. That they believed falsely, Jesus was crucified upon a false belief, but they believed they had a part of it. And so they believed if they took this with them in the battle, uh, God would give them victory. And they had it with them. They, they're going forth, but they're all... And there were knights called the Knights Templars, who were a military order. Two military orders, the Hospitallers and the Knights Templars, and these were monks. These were monks who were not even allowed to wear like colorful clothing. It was against the monastic order for them to wear colorful, colorful clothing. And they had to eat bread and drink water and live in, in monasteries. But they would go and they were the most excelled in warfare. They were the best in warfare. And there were hundreds of them there participating in the Battle of Hattin. Salah Hadin knew that you can never take the nice Templars as prisoners of war because if they lived, they would cause the most damage to the Muslim world. And so the Knights Templars are there guarding the, the bishops of Lidda, are guarding the, the true cross with their life because they have to make sure that that remains. Salah Hadin knows this and so he sends a large reinforcement of people go and fight there the bishops of Lidda who are guarding the, the true cross. Because if we get that in our hands, all the morale would sink. They would feel as if there's no purpose to fight because God is now not happy with them. And so it was an outstanding victory. The Muslims had a much larger army. All these three generals came along. They all fought. The crusaders are weak, fatigued, thirsty, and they all have the smoke and the ashes in their faces. And it was a disaster for them. And it was a magnificent victory for the Muslimin. The Battle of Hattin. In the Battle of Hattin, my dear brothers, who was there? The King of Jerusalem. Gidi Yusuf Lusingon. This shaitan, uh, uh, the one I mentioned, Reynold de Chatelon, he was there. 230 Knights Templars were, were participants in that. Raymond of Tripoli, all the heads of the Crusaders were there and they were all either killed or captured. Imaduddin al Isfahani says, Rahimullah, that we saw the numbers of prisoners were so many, we couldn't believe anyone had been killed. And those who were killed were so many, we couldn't believe anyone had been taken prisoner. It was just colossal numbers on both sides of the prisoners and of those who had been killed. Magnificent victory. And they were all there. One of the beautiful anecdotes that Al Isfahani writes in his chronicle, he says there was an old man, an old man who took part in the battle. This is really interesting. This is his anecdote. He says an old man took part in the battle. And when the battle was won, because he had to have some ghanima, some spoils of war, because he took part in the battle. And so they gave him a frank soldier. He could be like a servant for him. You know, he could be someone to plow the fields. Strong, big frank for him. What does the old man do? He says to the people, exchange this frank for me for a pair of sandals. I want, I want a pair of sandals instead. I don't want this frank. What is this? I don't need this. I, I want a pair of sandals. And they said, come on, come on. You're maybe losing your mind, you're too old, you know. They said, come on. This man can plow your fields, you know. He can be a servant for you. Why do you want a sandals? We'll buy you sandals. What's the big deal in that? He says, no. 
No, this is how they used to think, my dear brothers. This is how, this is history, memorializing of history. He says, no. He says, I want those to come, who come after me, like us today, to read, to read, read. That the, these crusaders were so insignificant and worthless and cheap in the eyes of the Muslims that an old man once sold one of them for a pair of sandals. An old man once traded one of them for a pair of sandals. That's empowerment. Empowerment. You know, emboldening the ummah. Emboldening, empowering the ummah. One of them was traded, exchanged for a pair of sandals. What happened in Salah Hadin when, when all the, the prisoners were there? King of Jerusalem, Reynold de Chatelon, Raymond of Tripoli, all of these are there. Salah, Salah Hadin, he approaches the king of Jerusalem. This is king and king, you know, king and king. And he invites uh, Gidi Lusing on to Islam. But he doesn't accept Islam. In any case, he gave him some water to drink. You know, after a hot day of fighting, have the water to drink. He drank from the water. Beside him was uh, the shaitan, you know, Reynold de Chatelon, and he gives the cup of water to drink to Reynold de Chatelon. He says, you know, you have a sip of water. And then he began to gulp and gulp and gulp from the water. Salah Hadin then speaks and says, you know, in our custom, our custom, a king doesn't kill a king. We don't, kings don't kill kings. And nor do we kill the one that we've just given water to. Because in our custom, water is like an offering of hospitality and peace and protection. We don't kill the one that we've given water to. So him, the king of Jerusalem, he's a king, and a king doesn't kill a king. And I gave him water to drink. I didn't give you water to drink. You gave him the water to drink. You gave him it. You gave the water. I didn't give the water to drink to him. He invites Reynold de Chatelon to Islam. Aslim. Aslim. Accept Allah. Your life is saved. No. Arrogance. Pride. Arrogance. Pride. No. And so he takes his scimitar and he separates his arm from the shoulder and then he pushes him towards the others and they execute him. Each of those 230 Knights Templars were executed that day. Just like he promised. That none of them can be left alive because of the damage they do to the Muslim because of their had excelled in warfare and carrying of arms. It was a mag and then the king of Jerusalem sent into exile. It was a magnificent victory for the Muslims. What's left then? Jerusalem. But also the Crusader states. And Salah Din is left in this predicament. What does he do first? Take, try and take the coastline of Sham or Jerusalem? The heart is saying Jerusalem, but in essence the mind would have been the Crusader states because if you don't take them, you always leave an avenue open for the Crusaders to launch another attack against you. In any case, he went for Jerusalem. Now look at this, what happened in Jerusalem. Jerusalem has no king because the king now is captured and taken into exile. A man called Balian of Ibelin, who fought in the Battle of Hittin, but he escaped, was riding back to Jerusalem because he knew that Jerusalem is next. In Jerusalem is his wife, Maria Comnina, and her children. And what he wants to do is enter Jerusalem, take his wife and their kids out of Jerusalem, and then just go and live a life somewhere else. And the crusade business is finished for him. But he needs guarantee from Salah Din that this could happen. He sends a letter or a detachment, something to Salah Din, asking for permission. Salah Din agrees. He says, I give you permission on one condition, you don't ever raise up arms against me. Never pick up the sword against me ever again. I will let you and your wife and her kids leave Jerusalem. He says, perfect, perfect, perfect. He gets to Jerusalem, what happens? The patriarch of Jerusalem, in Jerusalem, 
petitions Bailey and Avibalan and says, look, now we have no king of Jerusalem. Uh, you are going to be the de facto ruler, king of Jerusalem. You're going to defend this city. He says, no, I have, a, I have a deal, a contract with Salah Adin. I would never raise up arms against him. I'm going to take my wife and kids out of this country. Thank you very much. He says, what are you talking about? He says, all the deals, contracts you make with the, the disbelievers, meaning the Muslims, they don't count for anything. They're not even valid in our religion. So don't have to worry about that anymore. Don't worry about not taking arms against anybody. He's stuck. So he has to defend Jerusalem, but he still has the issue with his, with his wife and her kids. He sends another letter to Salah Adin and says, look, I can't keep the deal with you anymore. I'm going to defend the city of Jerusalem, but I'm still going to ask you, can my wife marry Kamina and her kids leave Jerusalem? What do you think Salah Adin says? He says, yes. But not only does he say, yes, they can leave, women and children is not our affair, my dear brothers. Wallahi, women and children are not our affair. We do not target women or children in anything. He says they can leave, but not only that, when they're leaving Jerusalem, he showers them with gifts, clothing, and gifts, and toys, and clothing, to show this is our deen, my dear brothers. This is our deen. We will defend, we will fight to retake Jerusalem, that is our haq, our right. But we will not exceed, we will not do evil things you did to us in 1095 when you took Jerusalem from us. Slaughter. Ibn al-Athir rahimahullah says when they took Jerusalem in 1095, up to 70,000 Muslims were killed in that city. 70,000 Muslims were killed in that city. One of the Christian chroniclers, Albert of Aachen, this is not Muslim propaganda, this is a crusader saying this. He's writing in his German chronicler, Albert of Aachen. He says that we, we, crusaders, you should take babies and swing them and smash their skulls on the walls. They, they had this, this thing they would say, dus volt, dus volt, dus volt, dus volt, which meant God wills it, God wills it, God wills it, God wills it. It's all good because God wills it to happen. This vault, it, God wills it, God wills it. They would do everything. Carnage, slaughter, killing everything. Except the farmers they needed because they didn't know how to, you know, agriculture for the land. They had to keep them alive so that they could work the land, the fields for them. But it wasn't the same. When he arrived at Jerusalem, the siege didn't last. It lasted a week, if I remember. You know, not that long. Until it was breached. There was a breach in the wall and then Balian comes out and he knows that he has to make terms with Salah Adin. And the terms were this, that they have to pay a ransom, 10 dinars for a man and 5 for a woman and then 2 or 1, 1 for a child. 10 and then 5 and then 1, if I remember. There were more than, there were thousands who could not afford to pay the ransom and Salah Adin allowed them to leave Jerusalem free of charge. Just to exemplify the mercy of what Islam represents, that we fought you to retake this city, but we're not going to be cruel to you. You know, there was, there, there's accounts, for example, where when they were leaving Jerusalem, the patriarch of Jerusalem is leaving with gold, gold plates and rugs, worth so much money. And they say to Salah Adin, Salah Adin, look, why, why don't we keep these things here? We didn't say to them to leave with all of the gold and the rugs. That wasn't part of the deal. They had to just leave paying the ransom. Why? Salah Adin said no. He said, let them go with their things. I don't want. When they set foot back in Western Europe to say that we did not observe the letters of the treaty, it's better that they just leave and don't trouble us again and that we have Jerusalem. Protection of Jerusalem. The land of Quds. We have this land, the sanctity of Allah. We have this back with us. There were, there were situations where the, when the crusaders were leaving, the old men were walking, toiling out of the city. They've lived there for generations, generations now. 
88 odd years, long time. And the squires, squires, nobility, are leaving Jerusalem with their fine horses. And they tell Salahuddin, look at this, well, look at this, what they're doing. You know what he says? He says, go to them, pull down these squires and nobility off the horses, and these old men, put them on the horses, and make the squires and nobility walk behind them. What business? What business, my dear brothers? Ethics. At least when they go back to Western Europe, they can say we learned some good manners from the Muslims. The narration of Abdullah ibn Umar, what does it teach us? When he sees the two men walking, one older, one younger, the one younger in the front, the one older behind, he says, Man ma'ak. Who is this with you? Behind you. He says, Abi, my dad, my father walking behind me. He says, Subhanallah. لا تمشي أمامه Don't walk in front of your father. ولا تجلس قبله Don't sit before your father sits. And don't call your father by his first name. Reference. وصينا الإنسان بوالدي Allah, this is not, this is not just Muslim. وصينا الإنسان بوالدي We enjoined upon man to show goodness to his parents. All people, this is a human call, this is a universal call for all people, recognition of your humanity. You know, I, I owe it to the elderly for what they've done in my life and so on and so forth. And this is remarkable that he did these kind of things. And then they leave Jerusalem, but there was a treaty that was signed. That they, they, the pilgrims were allowed back into Jerusalem to worship in peace, just like before. They would keep, if I remember, Jaffa, and Tyre, they would keep these two. And the Muslims have Jerusalem. And then began the process of cleaning Jerusalem. And so they would uh, perfume the floors. Nuruddin, I will tell you this, and I'm sorry for dragging on, but Nuruddin Zengi, rahimallah, before he died, he made a minbar, like this beautiful minbar. Beautiful minbar. And he had like this uh, ambition. He says, inshallah, when we recapture Jerusalem, we will install this minbar in Aqsa. Now, he died in 1174, and this is now 1187. So that's 13 years difference. Salah Din, this was, by the way, in Aleppo. They kept the minbar in Aleppo, Halab. He said, go to Aleppo and bring the minbar of Nur din and we will install it in Aqsa. And then there was competition about who would be the first khatib, the first khatib in Aqsa, after all these years, there was a competition. You know, Muhyiddin ibn al-Zaki, he won. Muhyiddin ibn al-Zaki was the first khatib in, in the first Jummah uh, after the reconquest of Jerusalem. I will tell you this. In the Dome of the Rock, Qubat al-Sakhra, there is a dome. Dome, the Dome of the Rock. There was, there was uh, amongst the ulama, there was a, a, a plan that they had to have Quranic inscriptions around the dome of the Dome of the Rock. Around the dome. And so they had to decide, okay, which ayat of the Quran would you have around the dome of the Dome of the Rock? You know what they settled on? They settled on the first 21 ayat of Surah Taha in the Quran. The first 21 ayat of Surah Taha. And there is a profound wisdom behind this. Because it's in these 21 ayat about Musa salam and Fir'aun, and also when Allah is asking, وَمَا تِلْكَ بِيَمِينِكَ يَا مُوسَى What in your right hand, O Musa, it's a stick. Allah says, throw down the stick. What happens? It becomes like a serpent. He becomes scared. Allah says, come back, don't be scared. We will... سَنُعِيدُهَا سِيرَةَهَا الْأُولَى This is ayah 21. Allah says, we will turn this snake back into its original state again. And this was the 21, 21st verse. And there is symbolism attached to this, in that they wanted the Muslims to always remember. Even though Quds was taken for 88 years. Allah, Allah. You know, just, just like... The stick of Musa Allah reverted it back to its original state. 
Likewise, goods came back to its original state. And like that, goods will come back to its original state, my dear brothers. And so you have faith, and you have hope. And there is effort, and there is work. May Allah help the Muslims of Palestine. May Allah aid them. And may we be of those who aid them. Salah Din in 1192 became extremely ill, very ill. They would say things like, you know, like when it was winter, he would not wear his big coat. You know, or when it was hot, he would wear his big coat. He didn't, they thought he was losing his mind, you know. So there was a time then he became bedridden. This is 1193 now, bedridden. And the, uh, the Quran, the reciters of Quran would come and they would recite Quran. And others would come and recite Quran again all day, all night, you know. One thing I want to mention here at the end. Salah al-Din, he had a son called Al-Zahir, his son. His son was leaving out of Damascus. By the way, Salah al-Din, he resettled in Damascus. He loved the city of Damascus more than any other place, Dimashq. That was the land of his upbringing. May Allah bless the land of Dimashq. May Allah give victory to the Muslimin of Bilal Sham. He loved the land of Dimashq. And he wanted to settle and die there in that city. So this was in Damascus now, and the reciters are coming. His son was leaving. He comes back and he says, I'm going to pay a last visit to my father. This is the advice, my dear brothers. This is of a dying man. This is a dying man, a dying father's advice to his son. Sultan, he was Sultan, Salah al-Din, the man who unified the Ummah, recapped Jerusalem, hero of Islam. This is his dying advice to his son, my dear brothers. He said to his son, Usika bi taqwa Allah. I instruct you with the taqwa of Allah. Because that is the ra's al amr That is the head of all the, all the issues, all the effects. Sabab al najatik That is the, the means of your salvation. Taqwa Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says, Wa usika. And I instruct you to look after the affairs of your subjects, your people. Your people. Because I have not achieved what I have achieved in my life except by being good to people. Allahu Akbar. I have not achieved what I have achieved in my life except by being good to people. كُلُّكُمْ رَاعٍ وَمَسْؤُولًا رَأْيَتِهِ Our Prophet said, all of you are shepherds. All of you are shepherds. Your fathers, fathers, guardians, trustees, a'imma, imams, all of you have domains of responsibility. The Prophet of Allah says, all of you are shepherds. And each one is responsible for his flock. Every one of us is responsible for our flock, our children, our homes, our domain, where we are. He says to his son, Salah al-Din is saying this, I warn you against spilling blood, because blood doesn't sleep. Because blood doesn't sleep. There is always revenge, retaliation and revenge and retaliation and revenge and there's no peace if you take it upon yourself. Just to kill and kill and kill everything that's living. He once said, لا أريدهم, meaning his children, لا أريدهم أن يأتادوا في سفك الدماء. I don't want them to become, you know, Make a habit of just killing and killing. There's a need sometimes. There's a need in defense. There's sometimes a need. But I don't want you to make a habit of killing. Or to go to extremes in, sp in spilling blood. He said, وَلَا تَحْقُدْ عَلَىٰ أَحَدٍ فَإِنَّ الْمَوْتَ لَا يَبْقِي عَلَىٰ أَحَدٍ He said, don't bear grudges against anybody. Because death spares nobody. Don't, spare, don't bear grudges against anybody. Because death spares nobody. Salah al-Din had 16 children, my dear brothers. 
16 children. 16 children. But they realized, whilst having 16 children, responsibility for the Ummah. There was an account in Nur al-Din's life, by the way, rahimahullah. He gave his wife three shops in Hama, in Syria, three shops. And he said, all the money you make from these shops, for you. Once she came to him and she said, you know what? I need more, more money, more money. It's not enough for the family, more money. You know what he said to her? لَيْسَ لِي إِلَّا هَذَا I have nothing except this. وَجَمِيعَ مَا بِيَّدِي أَنَا فِيهِ خَازٍ لِلْمُسْلِمِينَ And everything that I have, I am a trustee for the Muslims. لا أخونهم ولا أخوض نرى جهنم لأجلك And I will not betray them. And no will I enter hell because of you. <laughs> no will I enter hell because of you on your sake. No, responsibility, trustee, looking after the affairs of the Muslims. And then one particular night, um, you know, they realized how bad he was and the reciter was reciting from the Quran. And he was reciting, Huwallahu allazi la ilaha illa hu. Huwallahu allazi la ilaha illa hu. It reminds me once they said to Nur al-Din, Nur al-Din didn't like his name, Nur al-Din. He didn't, he, his name was Mahmoud. Mahmoud. They, everybody has a deen. Shams al-Din, Nur al-Din, Kamal al-Din, Salah al-Din. Everything has a deen. He didn't like it. He thought it was just pretentious. Everybody has deen. What is this business? <laughs> he just, he preferred to be called Mahmoud. And once they said to Nur al-Din, you know what, Nur al-Din, don't fight at the front. Be at the back. Because if you're killed, then who is going to you know, protect the lands of Islam? He says, وَمَنْ مَحْمُودْ أَنْ يُقَالَ لَهُ هَذَا Who is Mahmud? That this is said to him. وَمَنْ حَفِظَ الْإِسْلَامُ بِلَادِ الْمُسْلِمِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِ Who protected Islam and the, Muslim, and the lands of Muslims before me? ذَلِكَ اللَّهُ الَّذِي لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا هُو they were reciting Quran on Salah al-Din, Huwa Allahu al-Ladhi la ilaha illa hu. And he came and his last words that they had was from him was Sahih. Sahih. Alayhi tuwakkal. Sahih. He said it's true. And then he died in that state. Everybody will die. Everyone will die. And it is not about what we leave behind today because Salah Adin, what did he leave behind? They said, Lam yajidu fi khazinatihi ma yakfi li takfinihi. Salah Adin, they said about it, Ibn Shaddad says, Lam yajidu, that they didn't find in his treasury enough money to bury him. Enough money to bury him. They didn't have money for the shroud. That came from Al Qadi Al Fadl, gave them money for the shroud. They did not have enough money for the straw to line his tomb. That money was provided for. He left in his treasury one dinar and 47 dirham. One dinar and 47 dirham. The man who took the palace from the Fatimid Khalif. They said, we just saw gold, gold everywhere. But he took nothing for himself. A man who recaptured Jerusalem, but took nothing for himself. No. That's not what we take with us in the next life, my dear brothers and sisters in Islam. No. It is about like they advised Nur al-Din, مَهِّدْ لِنَفْسِكَ حُجَّةٌ تَنْجُو بِهَا Prepare for yourself an excuse before Allah for the day that you meet Him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so he realized then it was about his deeds, about his a'mal, about his actions, not about these small temporary stuff, the stuff that we gloat over in this world. No, that is musibah, musibah for us. May Allah have mercy on Salah al-Din. May Allah have mercy on Nur al-Din. You know, I will end by saying this. I know I've said this many times, but I will end inshallah by saying this, yeah. You remember we said right at the beginning, 
the, the first book that was written called Kitab al-Jihad by Ali ibn Tahir al-Sulami. He died in the same year or the year after, if I remember. 1105, 1106, he died. People didn't really pay that much attention to his book. But in 1187, the year of the reconquest of Jerusalem, in the Sama'at, in the hearings of Hadith, they brought out the book of who? Ali ibn Tahir al-Sulami. The author who 80 odd years before wrote that book, it was his book. Although in the Islamic tradition there's been much more bigger, important books with the same title, Kitab al-Jihad, Abdullah ibn Mubarak's very famous text, Kitab al-Jihad. But they wanted to use his text because he sowed the seeds, but he didn't see them cultivate. But they cultivated at the end of the day. And that is also his work, his effort. The famous poem of Al Abi Warati, it wasn't, didn't materialize in his time, but it materialized much after him, much later than him. Never ever deem small, insignificant your actions, but always have hope in the promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You don't know, one day, somewhere, somehow, how the effects of that would multiply and resonate with the people. May Allah bless all of you. May Allah love all of you and bless all of you. May Allah forgive all of us, have mercy on all of us. And may Allah make us an ummah of strength. And may Allah make us an ummah of sacrifice and an ummah of principle and justice. Justice. You know, may Allah make us a great people. Jazakumullahu khairan. سبحانك الله وبحمدك أشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت استغفرك وأتوب إليك والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته